Oh no, not prepared anything really. Just just to say the reason why I brought this topic up, although I actually really, really was young because Nikki said so. Um, but I had discussed earlier in the week bringing it up here um, because there was a blog post by Matthew Taylor in the USA. I hope you've seen it. It was about a discussion that he'd had like off mic in the Moral Maze studio about why Eastern European immigrants are taking up low paid work on farms and etc. etc. And that was when low paid when you when you were talking I thought this yes. And the local youth wouldn't take it up. And you know, I think there was lots of banter about you know, lack of work ethic and things like that. But Matthew Taylor's point was that he thinks it's because the Eastern European immigrants come here because it's part of a wider worldview they have that there's money to be made in this country, so we'll come here and do this menial, low-paid job for a while, but it's a gateway to something else. Um, whether it's sending money back to the family or earning enough to go back and set up their own business or something like that. Whereas young people don't have that wider worldview in their life. They are channeled very much into thinking in certain ways about their futures. And they don't see low paid menial work as being part of that future uh, because they don't see a way out of it. And if they, they think if they get into it, they'll be, it'll be a dead end for them. Absolutely. And they'll never get out of it. Yeah. So part of his argument was how do we help young people build that picture of the future of their lives? Mm. And that's both about envisaging, envisaging the future and where they see themselves going. But it's also about not necessarily seeing low paid meaning work as a dead end, but as a stepping stone to something else. Yeah. So that's that's my sort of um, thesis. Yes, yes, it is. Because I think with young people, it's, it's also not just the thing about low paid meaning work, it's also about whatever career choice they make. I was at a parents' evening recently for a sixth form thing, and they're talking about, you know, that they're, they're sort of 17 and they must choose their career now. And we're very worried because our child is 17 and they haven't decided what they, must, they want to do with the rest of their lives now. And that kind of whole thing of, you know, allowing young people to feel that there is flexibility, you know, they can choose something now and do that for a few years and then, go, and, you know, that, that won't be their lives forever, even if their job they're, they're choosing isn't meaningful and they pay, even if it's, you know, something that their parents pursue for their career, they can do that for a bit and then choose to do something else in their, you know, late 20s, 30s, whatever. I'm just I'm managing nicely to sit out, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that this resonated with me because my daughter, who's 16, is going to sixth form college, she's a really talented actress, singer, and dancer. But I talked to her about her future career, and she, she wants to be a teacher. Well, she started off being wants to be a nursery nurse, and now she's changed to wants to be a teacher. And I think, I think it's because she's been fed this line by her teachers and others yes. to look for a safe yes. career and that uh, singing, acting, dancing is a risky option. Yes. Whereas I would what much rather... What was the luxury? Yeah. Yes. I would much rather her be happier and pursue something that she's passionate about. Yes, yeah, that whole you have to get something that will pay the bills and kind of get a good pension and then, you know, you're going to be okay with, with that. You can do the extra stuff as hobby, the fun stuff that you really want to do as, as hobbies. Yeah. Mm. And if you study, you have to go for a sort of vocational course. So does this resonate? It does, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know, that, and I think it's the whole thing of kind of work becoming your identity, kind of children being told that at a young age, and if you are doing low paid menial work, uh, that is, that you somehow, yeah, failed. Mm. Um, even if you're using that to kind of fund the stuff that you really want to do. Yeah. Yes. So what do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> so you got a solution to that? Um, no, I've got a solution. I think it's, uh, I think the, I think there I think there are many things within that. I, th I think that there's that story that kids are told and continue to be told that you must decide that well I mean depending if you're in Birmingham then there are nine and ten year olds that are going through the coaching process to go to King Edwards and they are told that this is a decisive moment and then yeah, you go to 14 and you go to 16 and these are all and this builds up into this and at every stage you have that ability to fail 
and that fact that feeling of failure can just persist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're told, it, when, when the teachers are using the blackmail of if you fail this exam, it will affect you for the rest of, the, of your life, in order to try and get, get the child to do some work. Then it's, that's, that, that's really, really unhealthy. And we have a society that worries far too much about competition than it does about cooperation. And yeah. that I think that's one of the really fundamental problems that we have. And the fact that that in turn pushes a judgment on people who, who, are, who are in low paid jobs. Um, and with all that, it's difficult to see how we expect to have a society that's kind of, kind of seems to be a nice aim to have. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think I hate that emphasis on competition. I mean, I was at, I talked to someone about this earlier on, I was at the Leeds Local Enterprise Partnership Summit a couple of weeks ago, which was a horrible thing. It, oh, well, yeah, it was really horrible. There were 750 people there. I'm sure there were. And they were all sat there falling asleep for the most of the day. Um, you know, it was a really horrible event, no attempt at engaging anybody or interacting or anything like that. But they kept talking about competition. And at one point somebody said, oh, we are no, this is, this is about Leeds, we are no longer competing with Manchester. Wow, great, but we are now competing with Madrid and <laughs> Barcelona. I thought, well, why not collaborate with them? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I don't have a TV and the people in my office keep going on about things like The Apprentice and Dragonstone and stuff. And the last series of Apprentice I did think, okay, if they're going on about it, so I will watch the, the first episode of this just to see what it's like. And there's all these people on the TV saying things like, you know, I'd happily step over my own grandmother if it meant I made more money. And as if they're, you know, quite proud of all of this stuff. And it, it just it really worried me. It's just kind of a normal, okay thing for people to say now, you know? Mm. And, and the... The only sort of compensation seems to be this sort of, you know, 15 minutes of fame, you know, the, the whole thing about celebrity as well seems to be part of mm. that. That's the only, that sort of almost random... Oh, you're going to get me on X Factor, X Factor round here, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but, uh, but it's so pervasive. I mean, how can you uh, sort of combat that? Uh, I mean, it's, I it's, 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 really, something... it's really difficult, and I think, you know, I know a lot of people involved in things like the music industry. And there's two things about the X Factor. One is, it's. I think it should be. It should be prosecuted for the way it treats people with obvious, obvious mental illness. A lot of people who are in the early rounds have obviously got mental illness, and they hold them up to ridicule. So I think it is the modern bed bedlam. Um, but the other thing is, that, is that it. It basically presents that the only way to succeed is to, you know, is to go for this superstar thing like this, rather than working your way gradually up. Which has always been the way in any industry, and particularly the music industry. You know, you work hard at it, and eventually you might get your break. And even if you don't, it's still a nice thing to do. And people can earn comfortable livings, even if they're not superstars. Uh, but no, it's it's the only way to be is to like crash and burn. Like you have you have to go for the top. You know, and, and very few people who do that, and particularly they do it with any grounding, succeed. And those who do, it's very short lived. Um, and I think it's really, really unhelpful, unhelpful, unhealthy. I know, and I, I do think, seriously, I do think it's part of the culture which ends up with people smashing in the windows of JJB to get the latest yes. trainers. Yes, it's hand in hand. Mm. Yeah, because it, it's that whole thing of, yeah, what is success? Yeah, it's that kind of conspicuous consumption, having all the latest brands and things. And, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, what do we do about it? I mean, is there something about, I mean, I think the, the careers advice that young people get is pretty shocking you know mm. and there's so many things that people do that people just have no idea I mean you know I meet people at things like this and just think wow you can really make money doing all of this stuff you know like you doing what you do John and everything well, you know it's like no. okay. <laughs> in theory you can make money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think yeah people, uh, young people just don't kind of really know what's out there so I think there's something about about you know proper careers advice and proper um, yeah just just young people knowing what's what's out there I think that would Make make sense and kind of yeah that yeah and kind of other that that kind of you can have value in yourself for things other than the job that you do um, and again you know that's not very very um, a very common belief in our society you know people are you know they, they, when you ask someone about themselves usually the first thing they tell you is about what they do for a living yeah um, I think the interesting thing is I think it was in that that blog by Matthew Taylor I think he did say 
that it's not low paid menial work per se because people like McDonald's and Marks and Spencers do have far more applications for posts than they can cope with. And that's because they're seen as good companies to work for. Yeah, so they've got a big push up at the moment, McDonald's, about saying that it's not unskilled labour, that they've got an apprenticeship worth five, it's worth five GCSEs or something. There's posters all over every time we mm. McDonald's, there's posters up saying that sort of thing. So, yeah, they're kind of seen as places where, you, again, you can progress and become a manager and yes. good career structure. Um, so, yeah, even if you start at the bottom. So, yeah. But again, it's that thing of, you know, you might not be a success now, but if you work hard in the future, mm. you will be. So isn't there, a, isn't there a contrast between the social, the social media, the social networking, the way that people are talking to each other and communicating online, and the fact that if you share something digitally, it's at no cost to yourself, typically. It might be the, the cost of writing something out, you know, a quick tweet to help somebody and send them a link to something and this idea that we're all in competition with each other. Because there's, there's a distinct difference between the two, way, the two ways of working. Aren't there? Yes, and also kind of online building an identity online that's about you know, the things that you, you, you do beyond your job, you know, the things that you're interested in, which might be things to do with your job, but also kind of other things as well. So I think there's definitely something there that the digital space could kind of help with. Yeah. That, that, that's difficult, isn't it? I was doing some work with, with a local authority, and one of the officers in this local park authority says, I don't want to use Facebook to talk to people, because so, they might find out what I do in my spare time. And this guy, who was you know, he was a middle-aged, relatively senior officer in the local authority, told me that he did, he went to rave parties in his spare time. He didn't want his colleagues to know about it. Every chance that he's all over social networks anyway, oh, unless yeah. he goes in a gimp mask or something. <laughs> <laughs> because the, my my experience of going to to any kind of concert gig rave recently is that mm. you are being constantly recorded, especially mm. if you want to get anywhere near the front. Mm. Everyone's there. The, the, the proliferation of people holding up their phones oh. in front of your gigs. Seeing, seeing something at a gig is quite if you're, you're seeing it on your little phone, you won't be screaming at your phone, you're yes, actually looking at it with your eyes. <laughs> I was amazed, to be honest, I was amazed a few years ago now, I, I went to a gig for the first time for years, I hadn't been for years, and when I first saw the people with their phones, I was waiting for someone to pounce on them, because that's what used to happen if you were tempted to record anything, yeah. mm. gig, you'd get pounced on. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it has really shifted, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, Oh, I was just going to say, it's my, I, I don't know, it's my perception that um, young people tend to use Facebook rather than mm. Twitter, but I, sure I don't know what the either. statistics are on that. No, no, you're right, you're right. There was that thing um, last year that, I can't remember who it was, but it was some young person who was working for a newspaper or something, I don't know, that some intern, and yeah. asked him to write about that, and he said it was because um, young people, could, you know, uh, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, he said that it, they did definitely use Facebook and Twitter. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can find the link and put it on the Yeah, well, they do. Um, yeah. I think there's a variety of reasons for that. I think one is that most young people don't create their own content, despite the hype that we're all content creators these days. Most young people don't. I mean, I, 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 I mean, people are online, we talked about it earlier on. I connected with her, her on Twitter recently um, and was. You know, she kept tweeting links to her top of the blog, and I think, oh, that's just probably interesting. And every time I get, clicked on the link, it was not something she created, it was just something that she'd found and was of interest. And I was thinking, you know, I'm used to connecting with people who, who are telling me something of interest, not just telling me something, you know, here's a picture, I like this picture. And, that was, and I think that's what young people do, you know, it's like they're exploring, they're exploring what they like, and they like to share it with their friends. So they don't necessarily create stuff. No, they're kind of more curating the internet for themselves and their friends. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there, there is merit in that, well, yeah, but, sure. but, but it's like taking the next step, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and there's also that thing which says, um, what is the quote, I think, I think the quote is, Twitter helps me love people I don't know, whereas Facebook help, Facebook makes me hate people I do know. <laughs> yes, that's so true. Yeah, and, and, and part of this narrative as well is, is the sort of oversharing that a lot of young people do, which can come back to hold them. Yeah.
future lies, isn't it? And how you help them deal with that. Because if we are telling the stories of our lives, which is what Mark Zuckerberg says now Facebook is about, it's the story of our life. Um, it means it's all there. What's and all. I'm so glad they didn't have Facebook when I was a teenager. <laughs> That's just it, isn't it? I, I see young people all the time sharing stuff that I think, why would you want to share that? They do. And not only that, when they, um, what do they call it? Facebook rape each other? When they jump onto each other's profile and say stupid things? And say, you know what? Yeah. Well, it's either they've left their machine on or logged in or oh, shared right, their, yeah. their postcode, their passwords. And you know they log on to somebody else and uh, you know, start saying stupid things. So. But uh, we may not come to any conclusion. Is that the question we need was? Need to just Yeah. Well, yes. Yes. It's the one conclusion. I mean, I suppose part one of the things that happened was. Me, we all the crap in society, especially <laughs> we can and get our own lives. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, there were some attempts, weren't there, after the riots? Of, of, I can't remember it was now, but somebody did some videos of young people saying, why, I didn't riot. Yes. Did anybody see that? Yes, I think I saw them As a librarian, I'm sure you are. Get all get all young children into libraries and then they won't want it. Yeah, and close the doors and just not let them out until they're like twenty five. And <laughs> they've read all the books. <laughs> <laughs> After the riots, we had the uh, Birmingham Young Poet Laureate auditions, and there was 12 young, well, we had you know, about 80 young people, and uh, we had 12 finalists, and they were doing amazing poetry, some of them doing you know, stuff about politics and that sort of thing. Um, people that were also involved in things like the Birmingham Youth Parliament and all of that. And you know, children, children and young people like this, they don't really get you know, um, stories told about them in the media. It's all um, you know, the ones that are writing, the ones that are wearing hoodies and doing all the bad stuff. So, again, And this um, kind of slightly older lad, um, you know, the whole punk thing, stretched earlobes. He was the one that went over and kind of went went to help him. Um, so yeah, it's kind of where where most people would not. Yeah, so it's kind of what stories we tell about young people as well. I think. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the mainstream media just likes to demonise youth, doesn't it? Yes. So again, you know, this is part of a wider question I think about using social media to tell positive stories that the, the mainstream media are not interested in. Yeah, there is something about yeah encouraging young people to kind of yeah dream and imagine things and not being kind of yeah told that they they can't and they're going to get stuck within. Well, I think as well. I, I suppose if I come back to my own life, um, I'm trying to think what I wanted to be when I was younger. And I think I think that the two things I think I wanted to be one one was an actor and one was a writer, and I didn't become either. Uh, and I think it was just because I had no encouragement. I had no you know it just I thought it was. I didn't know anybody else who was doing it. And I think if we can use social media to connect people up with those wider possibilities and connect them up with role models who yes. are all doing things that are interesting. Yes. You know, and I think um, I sort of gave up the acting thing because I got a terrible stage fright and wasn't getting any encouragement, so I thought that was an excuse to give it up. And I gave up writing because I did an English degree. And with the English degree, just encouraged me to think there's no way I could do anything as good as that. So. Yes. <laughs> Um, Have you not read Dan Brown? Sorry? Have you not read Dan Brown? Well, I mean, no, I hadn't. <laughs> I can't give you the opposite. I hadn't at that stage. Anybody, anyone. <laughs> yeah. The problem is at university. So, so long as they suspend all taste. Yeah. My so, problem is at university, I read things like. Um, oh. I read things like Emily Bronte, and yes. Thomas Hardy, and Charles Dickens, which is where I get my love of storytelling from. Mm -hmm. But it also said to me, I couldn't ever do that. <laughs>
So yeah, there's so, something about their networks of kind of young people kind of got into mentoring, peer mentoring, or kind of old yeah. people yet mentoring younger people to kind of encourage them yeah. to, to go after the things that they really want to do. Yes. Yeah, because if you could have had access to the internet then and been able to connect to, yeah. to people who had encouraged you, do you think that would have made a can't be the self that they really want to be. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? And I suppose as you say, I mean people don't understand what careers there are out there. It's no. like you're a pop star or something, but you don't realise that you really can't do that just to come jobs in that industry, like management and sound technicians and all that sort of stuff. But I found myself musing last night. My daughter was singing in a concert with me. This is going on video, I shouldn't be saying this, but my daughter was um, singing in a concert last night uh, with the choir that she's in, and they were supporting this guy who plays the flute. And he's made quite an... He obviously has made quite a good career for himself playing the flute, and he played what I would, what I would call lift music. <laughs> it was... And he even played the panpipes as well as the flute. Mm. And I didn't enjoy it. It was not my kind of thing at all. But he, he and he also told really fun, funny jokes in between his um, playing the flute. Um, but he also talked about, I mean, he seems to make his living playing on cruise ships. Yeah. And I think, well, good luck to him because he obviously enjoyed playing the flute and he's made a fairly successful career out of it. But most people would think, well, if you're going to play the flute, you'd either play in an orchestra or be a superstar or nothing. You wouldn't think there is a career to be made out of this playing on cruise ships. He obviously enjoys it. I think it you know, made my ears bleed. But, <laughs> but you know, I say good luck to him. And he shows there are lots of different routes out there that people are not necessarily aware of. Yes. Yeah. And it's that kind of shift to recognising people are successful because of how happy they are and how kind of yeah. fulfilled they are rather yeah. than how much money they've made or how famous they are or, yeah. or anything like that. Um, Well, we'll go back to the X Factor thing. You know, yeah. The X Factor for themselves is the, the dream that music is about superstar, and it's not yes. worth it. Yes, go and make a whole load of money in a couple of years and then disappear mm. forever. Mm. Yeah. I think that idea about hearing the stories of people who've you know, gone in a certain direction is, can be quite useful. I remember when I was teaching film studies yeah. at college. Career, you know, um, at a quite late stage, and, and become a, 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 a well, a focus puller. But but he worked his way into the the film industry that way, um, uh, and I think he sort of ended up, you know, working on the Harry Harry Potter films. But again, at quite a sort of slow. One of the reasons why both my kids have done stints recently is extras on the Waterloo Road TV program, and they've actually both been quite reluctant to do it because even though they're both good at acting, they don't really see that as their future. But I've sort of encouraged them to do it because I think it might give them an insight, and not only will it give them an insight to what it's like to be an actor, but they will see everything going else that goes on, you know, the camera crews and all those sort of people, and it will open their eyes to the opportunities that are in the industry. Maybe it will. I mean, my lad spent 12 hours there, didn't they, getting really bored. So maybe it's put him off for life. But, <laughs> but maybe when all his mates see him on TV, yeah, that might change his mind. I presume they do, because he was an extra, so he wasn't actually spotted. But they wouldn't have, have taken part in that if you hadn't seen it. No, they wouldn't have taken part in that. 
What's your guess? Maybe it leads on to the kind of topic of, you know, can you really tell young people anything? Or <laughs> 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 just leave them, leave them to sort it all out for themselves? They listen to work and say, do they? In my dad. In my dad, I don't think I would have listened to anything that anyone would have said to me. Someone's a tongue in cheek. You can't tell them anything, but you can. Yeah, you can. Open their eyes up to possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, kind of show them, show them kind of positive stories of what's, what's there. Yeah. Well, I think it's far too warm to... Um, well, we're not, solve we're not supposed to bring our solutions anyway, but I think we're hearing a debate which will continue. Police seem to do it on a regular basis with their joke 999 calls, which is just fine, really. Um, and, yeah, I mean, your point about young people and, and mental health, if all we do is pushing people, young people, into, an, into a sense that they've either failed or succeeded, then neither of them are particularly healthy options for them. Well, I, I think even the ones that might have been seen to have succeeded, there's always kind of something else kind of out of left, um, just out of reach. You know, you might have got, you know, four A's, but did you get four A stars? You might have got four A stars, but did you get into Oxford Cambridge? You might have got into Oxford Cambridge, but did you get into the right college? You know, you know, there's all of these kind of, you know, it's kind of a constant kind of, kind of spark. You can of always, kind of fear you can and, always find yeah. somebody who has achieved more than you. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if it's if if life is a competition, yeah. then. You are always going to be able, everybody is always going to be able to find somebody who's yes. done something that they haven't And done. you're kind of always lacking in some, yeah. in some way, you're always kind of chasing something just... Yeah. And yeah, no wonder they would, well, but a lot of people have quite bad mental health if, um, yeah, if that's the case, that you can't be kind of happy as you are. Then, yeah. It's because, I mean, some of the ambition that's expressed in programmes like X Factor, it, it's almost sort of teetering. Insane, isn't it? It's like I, I'll die if I don't get, you know, emotionally blackmail the, the, the judges, you know. Um, I just find it so depressing. Because <laughs> it, it, it's just so extreme, yeah. It's either win or my life's shattered, you know. And, and that's not. First step next to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be the first step. Yeah. 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 Oh, you could just get Rupert a little push nowadays, couldn't you? <laughs> Can I switch the camera off? I want to have some wonderful ideas if I switch the camera off that way. Do that. 